Today, I'm speaking with producer and engineer David Alexander on the mental and creative challenges music makers face, how to get into the creative flow, and why our answer is not more gear. Please welcome David Alexander to the Music Production Podcast. Every single day, 120,000 songs are uploaded to the streaming services. And if each one of those songs is two and a half minutes long, that's 208 days of music every single day, which means over 200 years of music this year will be uploaded. How is your music going to stand out from that? I've got a brand new video called Finding Your Voice and Standing Out in Ableton Live 12. It talks about ways you can use some of the new features in Live 12, the tips, tricks, and techniques that will help you stand out. Plus, there's a lot of creative philosophical things that you can use in any DAW. Along the way, I create an instrument using my own voice recorded into a telephone microphone that's a playable instrument that you can download for free. If you follow along with the video, you'll know how to make one for yourself. So check it all out. It's at brianfunk.com, or you can go to my YouTube page at Brian Funk Music. And I hope you enjoy this conversation with David Alexander, who has lots of great thoughts and ideas on how you can be unique, have personality in your music, and stand out from the crowd. Enjoy. So, David, thank you for being here, bearing with a few technical difficulties we had. But um, I'm really happy to have you because, as I said before, um, you've got so much cool stuff. Um, you're, you're a producer, mixing engineer, mastering engineer, songwriter, uh, a lot of services you offer. And where I came across you was through your TikTok and Instagram because my drummer, Chris, is really enjoying what you've got. And a lot of times in our philosophical discussions as a band, some of the ideas that he's picked up from you start turning up in our conversations. So I started watching your stuff and I'm like, yeah, this is exactly what I'm into. Um, kind of more the creative philosophy stuff. Um, because that's the hardest part, even though we, you know, we just had technical difficulties here. That's a big part of what we do, but, um, it is really like that's stuff that gets solved. Usually it's oh, yeah, the yeah. other stuff that's really tough. And um, I've just been really enjoying your, your take on all of that. Thank you. Thank you. You've got like a background we were talking about in like punk rock, hardcore music. And I think a lot of that stuff has this sort of no nonsense kind of cut the BS attitude out of it with the music, with the whole culture. And you seem to bring a lot of that into your approach to what you do today. For sure. I mean, I think like, uh, if there's one thing that at least I was able to take out of, uh, punk and hardcore and ultimately is a big influence on me is kind of like more of a leftist kind of anti-capitalist view, which makes me pretty, uh, skeptical of kind of like the material reality of the objects we use to make music. And for me, at least, like being around now long enough, it's like I've seen like the pro audio industry go from servicing the pros to servicing consumers and how that started to like really impact people's perceptions of like what they're capable of doing or, or what they need in order to pursue their art. And I think a lot of what drives me to not talk about the gear as much is kind of realizing that like there's an element inside the gear industry, even though the stuff is great, like I love it, but there's a part of it which is sort of preying on people and their dreams. And it's like the reality is, you know, most people that love music love music that uh, at least some of it was made in the most, you know, meager means or just whatever was available to the artist. And I think that, you know, like just gear isn't the challenge for most people. And I think it's a, a big, uh, diversion from the, the kind of bigger path of making art and sharing that and like what that means for people. So kind of where I get that. Yeah, that's an interesting point because uh, back when I was growing up and it sounds like around the same time you were growing up, we didn't get advertised for like studio gear. You had to go to the studio. You didn't have your home. No. Studio. Maybe you had your four track recorder. Yeah, That's what yeah. I had. You know, four I track cassette. A, you know, <laughs> my buddy had a four track, which was very instrumental in in my whole life. But but yeah, I mean, when I'm old enough that like the gear there wasn't. Yeah, it wasn't marketed toward me as like a 14 year old, and and the gear I could get was horrible compared to <laughs> what's available now. And you know, it's changed so much. It's shocking in a lot of ways, but. You know, if anything, it makes me feel more uh, kind of interested in, in uh, going toward the 
non-consumable side of music because that's the stuff that like you can't you can't buy and and it's the part that's hard in all reality it's e- it's easy to buy stuff if you have the means but it's hard to make something that you know is good so yeah it's like starting out a workout regimen or something the easiest part is like buying your clothes and your sneakers oh, you know for sure for sure and it's like you get you get stoked you're like i i bought all this stuff and that's good and it's like with music gear you definitely i mean i think everyone has had instances where you buy something and you're playing with it and then that becomes like the vehicle for what turns into a song um but how much of that is actually the gear just versus like your own state of mind and your dopamine hit of a new thing um, yeah. and kind of like how to to navigate that without just having to feel compelled to just buy over and over again you know yeah and it is kind of funny too because now we do have all kinds of amazing equipment by just having a phone even or like any laptop that has garage band or anything like that you're you're stocked compared to where we were back in the day oh yeah i mean i even think about like in the kind of like early 2000s when i started my journey with like working with just like local bands and friends of mine it's like in 2000 and in six it's like if you had a 1500 bucks to buy some gear to try to make some music it's like what you can get now for the same amount like eclipses eclipses it i mean you can you know you could easily if you're making good music you can buy what you need to make it commercially viable for 1500 bucks assuming you have a laptop and it's like that wasn't even the case you know 20 years ago definitely not at all um, and it's it's crazy. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. yeah, we are suddenly empowered with all this stuff that it's like every dream that I ever had when I had a four track is now true. And I've got it. And still, like, it's this longing you get. And, and we are like very vulnerable to the, you know, the next plug in that's like, oh, it's going to do this. It's going to do that. Well, that's what, that's what I have problems with. That's why I can't make my hits. And for sure, for sure. <laughs> and I think I think it's easy for people like uh, people who are beginning artists or producers. I think it's easy to like look out onto the Internet. And then obviously, like the most successful people like have the most expensive stuff. And it's like I'll always see this content that's like, what's Justin Bieber's vocal chain? And it's like, obviously, Justin Bieber like has the most access. But it's like that doesn't really mean anything and it's like if justin bieber happened to just enjoy recording on some just random you know dynamic microphone released in the 80s that no one cares about it's like people would go crazy for that and it would still be making music people want to hear and so i think it's really easy for people to like look out into the expanse of everything that's happening in music and just assume that they need all these things to achieve their goals when all it is is like you know even for producers it's like the more money you make the more gear you buy and it's not because you need it it's because you just write it off your taxes <laughs> like it's it's not about i mean as much as other people will want to get lost in the weeds it's like it's not about anything other than consumption in a way or it's just part of the matrix we're in but you know it's like you don't need it or i don't really feel like that's the difference between someone like finding the success they want and not finding the success they want you know justin bieber is actually a really good example too because you know now you look at what he's got sure but he was once a kid on youtube with probably just some cheap camera filming him and that's how he got further and further along to where he is now so we kind of know what he started with yeah totally Um, Maybe a lot of other people, you see them once they've sort of reached that pinnacle of success. And then you say, oh, well, I need all those things because that's what you need to get there. Totally. And I think at large, like music, I think a lot of arts are like this, but music is really, you know, most people won't see someone till they've kind of found some success. And then I think that it gets really easy to not understand to not be able to view that process of getting there and then to just think that like you're somehow supposed to just 
you know, ha- I don't know, have a number one from nothing when really, you know, most people have a really long arc of, uh, of learning and, and fine tuning what they do and, and all of that before they find material success, you know, but that's not really shown to people when they go out into the really the internet's public space of music and look at what people have to say, you know? Hmm. Do you think that in some way having all of that stuff um, takes away from artists? Because um, if you sort of had to like get there on the meager gear and, you know, you know duct taping your cables together and stuff, <laughs> do you think at some point, like when you finally get all that stuff, that something's lost a little bit? Um, I try to not think as much as I can seem skeptical about gear at large, like I try not to think too much about this sort of like quest for the most authentic authenticity. And I think for me, the most, tr- the thing I'm most concerned about with like the fetish, the fetishization of gear is more so that it, uh, keeps us a- from the parts of the practice of being an artist that actually gets you into the productive state. And so I think like for engineers and producers or songwriters or anyone, it's easy to just be like, Oh, like I really want this mic and then you'll use the mic and then it's, it's new and maybe a different kind of presentation than you're used to. So you're like, this sounds awesome. And then in two months, like it's something else. And it's like, is that really helping you like learn more and dig deeper. It might be, it might not be. Um, but I think especially for a lot of it, especially when you look at like plugins and like synth VSTs, it's, you know, you could spend all day like buying and downloading every single one. And like that can easily be a distraction from just the act of making music. And I think a lot of times too, uh, It's like when you look at the intersection of learning music theory or consuming gear, most people seem like they spend more time thinking about their consumption of the products than stuff as simple as just like practicing your scales. And so I think a lot of times the consumption can get in the way of the practice that really will take you to the next step. Um, but at the same time, it's like, it's your fault. It's not the, the you know, the gear exists without any agency. It's like you that are, that's doing it in a way. So, you know, I'm, I'm pro gear, but like I personally try to just keep a, as much perspective as I can about like what's going to have a meaningful impact in my goals and like what I'm trying to accomplish, you know? Mm. Right, right. Yeah. You it doesn't matter how great your stuff is if you don't know how to EQ something or how to do basic functions with it. You know, when I first got some decent, it wasn't even decent. It was like I had a a compressor, a Alesis thirty six thirty, and a reverb. Yeah, and, the classic. And, <laughs> yeah, it was the first piece of gear I ever had to record. I was using eight app machines, the VHS tapes oh, that yeah, Elisa yeah, made yeah. too. So I didn't know what the hell I was doing with that thing. And I felt, you know, like compared to where I was a year ago with a four track cassette recorder, I was so far ahead and things sounded so much better, but not because of me. That was just, yeah, yeah. and I think a lot of the stuff I did with like that compressor especially was damaging to the sound. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I, I think that's that's maybe the most uh, damaging compressor ever released on the market. Yeah. The market. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, still I have it the, right here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I feel the same way. Just you know, like I've been doing this stuff for almost twenty years, and I feel like in the last two, I can really hear what the compressor's doing. At least I think I can. I thought I could before. So who? Who knows? Yeah. But it's like the it's such a long process, and it's uh, you know, and and the skill of listening. I mean, it it takes a lifetime, and I think that that's something that is harder to cultivate than people want to believe. Kind of, you know, like it, mm. it's it's you, it's hard to listen. You have to be 
proactive and disengaged at the same time. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a lifelong process, you know, and I've kind of given up on maybe not given up, but it's like, I try to never think that I have like kind of solved anything. I'm sort of perpetually like searching to un better understand the tools and, and better listen and better uh, have a deep understanding of, you know, what the processes are doing to the audio, why people might want to do that, why they might not want to do that. And, you know, mm. takes, takes a lifetime. Yeah. It is one of those like kind of unfinishable missions <laughs> learning yeah, yeah. music and producing music. And you make a good point about just listening, just really sitting there and paying attention. And for all the years I've been doing it, I'm still kind of shocked when I listen to a song I've heard a million times and notice something I never noticed before. It's like, well, totally. how the hell is that? Like I've been listening, I thought, but you're just, your depth of ability keeps growing and you start yeah, picking and, up. Yeah, and, and, and I think there's a huge, there's a huge context, like a cultural context to listening to. Like just the other day I was listening to Tom Petty and uh, I forget what song it was, but there's a song I've heard a million times and I was like, man, this sounds like shit. And, <laughs> and it's like, but you know, so many of the times that I listen to it, I'm just like, it's, it's Tom Petty, he's one of the greats. It's like, it's incredible. But like in that context at that moment, like in the headphones, when I wasn't listening necessarily to just enjoy it, I was like, in a lot of ways, the recording's not even very good. And I just never really thought about it. Um, and that also is a big part of kind of what I think about with music at large and how, you know, intersecting with the gear idea is it's like the most important thing is for someone to hear your song and just like it. And it's like whether or not it even sounds good is auxiliary to creating something that moves them. Um, and I think that's where I try to focus, you know, the intensity of my thought towards like, what is that? Like, how do you make something that grabs people and not being like, oh, I need I need this. I need this. So and so's DSing his vocals with this. So that's what I need to use, too. It's like you know, doesn't matter really. Hmm. Now, when you say it sounds like shit, <laughs> this is a fun question, I think, especially for you, because you're, and it even says like in your bio on your webpage, you're interested in artists who are not served by mainstream music. And in listening to the tracks you've worked on, these are not shiny pop songs. Like no, a lot, no, a lot no. Of them, a lot of them are aggressive and have, maybe even like certain vibe to them. And it's something totally. I love to do in my own music. I, I I think a lot of what I do, probably a lot of people would say sounds like shit. I will purposely <laughs> degrade the sound. Um, I love yeah. recording onto a tape machine and I love distorting things in weird ways or kind of doing stuff that the textbooks will tell you not to do, but it sounds neat as a character. So when you say that, what does that mean to you? Um, I guess like as much as I, like I, I work, you know, a lot of my work's been in like punk and hardcore and, and adjacent genres that all sound like shit. I mean, I'll be honest. They primarily it's sound kind of the style in a way. Yeah. Yeah. And I love it. Prim I, so I'm not yeah, speaking it, it, badly it, about this. No, ne neither am I. I mean, it's in service to the art. Um, but there's also like, there's a big part of me, like I grew up in uh like my dad is super into hi-fi and so he was a very very avid music listener and uh you know there's a part of me that really appreciates albums that are you know very meticulously crafted and you know stuff that would really be considered hi-fi you know as much as it's like i mean i even think about like stuff like you know lyle love it in the 80s it's like late 80s it's like those recordings are like they're like pristinely made and I do have a fascination with those kinds of sounds, even if it's not intersecting with kind of like what I make or what I do. Um, and I think that like, I don't know, I think there's a lot of stuff that doesn't really sound that good, but that's like not the point. The point is someone listening to music and being like, fuck yeah, like I love it. Um, and so 
yeah, I mean, there's tons of music that I think sounds bad. Um, <laughs> but but I also think like that's part of like as an engineer, it's like I in a way I it's like I have a fantasy in my mind of how something potentially could sound. And it's like as I'm making music and mixing music, it's like I'm always kind of trying to move towards some ideal that doesn't exist. And so because of that, it's easy to look at other stuff and just be like, oh, this sucks. The recorder or the mixing. But that doesn't mean that the music isn't awesome. And it also doesn't mean that like the mix doesn't like serve its purpose and doesn't serve the music and doesn't serve the artist. Um, and so I don't, if there's anyone out there that thinks I'm somehow telling them their mix sounds like shit, I'm not doing, <laughs> not doing that. Um, but I'm pretty willing to, you know, it's like most of my favorite albums ever like the most influential things on me it's like they don't it's not like a beacon of fidelity you know um you got any uh example on your mind something oh some i mean album? you know i mean i even think about all the stuff i was into when i was like first getting into punk you know just like no effects and all the fat records bands and like the Asian man records kind of ska punk stuff. And like, you know, none of that. I mean, it doesn't in any way sound like modern rock music at any stretch of the imagination. And even, you know, comparatively speaking for the time in the mid nineties, it's like a lot of it doesn't sound anything close to the mainstream music either. But it's like, that wasn't, you know, when I was little and loving it, it's like, that was not, a thought in my mind it was just mm. you know the energy and and the message and and everything it was about was all i cared about you know not so much you know how the snare sounded or something right well i think you said a, an important word there energy and you know thinking back to some of that stuff from my own memory they're very energetic they're they're like oh. hot those recordings and um they, yeah, they're they're raw, but they're they capture something, some of the spirit. Yeah, yeah, and it's like for a lot of music, um, you know, I mean, even to me with like punk oriented stuff, it's like a lot of records that people really love. It's like they wouldn't they wouldn't make any sense if they were redone today. You know, like could could you listen to Black Flag with the drums quantized and sample replaced? Mm. It's like it wouldn't make any sense. Mm. It would be it would it would be antithetical to what the music is. And you know, I think it's like, you know, music's no different than painting. It's like every painting doesn't have to be a realist portrait of something. Like it can be it can be any way of expressing it. And if that touches someone you know, that's the measure for, like, if it's good, you know, at least to me, I think of it that way. You know? mm. Yeah, that's a, that's a cool way to think about it. And, um, and with painting, uh, from my, you know, high school art history memory, which is <laughs> not the best, uh, a, a big moment happened when photography came out. Everything was realistic, was really important, kind of up until the photograph came out. And then you start getting a lot of this more like abstract stuff, impressionist stuff that was not meant to be that way on purpose. Um, I, I wonder if we're seeing that at all or if we will see that a bit because if things have gotten so slick and clean and maybe even generic in a lot of ways. And um, I'm wondering what, happens now with like ai last night i was online i got a comment on one of my videos and they were they said something like you know yeah it's a great time to make music but then suno came along which s-u-n-o i'm not yeah, sure yeah. if that's how you say it but i started playing around with it and i was like let me see if i can get something that sounds like kind of uh i guess authentic so i was writing yeah. in like acoustic guitar by the campfire yeah, and yeah. everything it spit out was just like really generic it's impressive that it can do that in seconds but it it felt just kind of like so bland you know yeah um and and i'm wondering if maybe we're gonna get to that i'm hoping we do honestly that we'll start like really embracing this kind of like idea of a 
the the emotion and not so much the slick kind of formula that seems like it's everywhere now. Yeah, and I think I mean I think about the AI related stuff a lot and especially lately it's been on my mind more and I've used I've played around with like some tools and it's interesting um and I think that you know for me my my primary kind of thought and concern with it is like I'm a firm believer that like you know like art is kind of like the domain of of humans and I think that like we already kind of live uh I just don't think there's a whole lot positive that will come out of like you know realistically you know multinational conglomerates like owning AI algorithms that then generate the majority of commercially viable music I don't think that's good uh for humans I think that I think that's I think that's ultimately kind of negative and it's like obviously there's an argument of like you know oh it's just a tool it, it's how you use it and that's true um I think my main skepticism comes from you know it's like if if universal music group like owns the most advanced AI as well as like the ways to you know get music in front of the most people and then that's just what it is it's like what's the what's the you know who does that serve like who, it doesn't really benefit anybody and it's like i think especially like coming from like a punk background is it's like i do believe like in music is like a vehicle of like social change and and personal change too i mean it's been hugely impactful for me and i think that like the more that it's controlled by you know the the powers that already have an outsized influence on you know the collective thinking of the world we live in it's like what's the you know what's the function of the music then that that's kind of like my main concern cuz you look at any of the big revolutions in music uh when it comes to sounds which are generally driven by technology it's like with those revolutions has come like a revolution sort of of the mind you know a, res a revolution of what people are thinking and and putting into the music and then how that ends up how that ends up going into the collective consciousness and and creating new ways of imagining the world we live in and so my biggest fear is like if it's if all the music is made by Disney it's like Disney's not going to tell you to increase their tax rate <laughs> like you yeah. know what i mean it's like what's the function of the music will be to serve the corporate overlords and that's the exact opposite thing that i'm interested in doing so i i get a bit frightened by it but you know i think the i think the unfortunate reality is within probably 5 or 6 years i imagine that ai will be able to generate songs that sound commercially convincing with lyrics and what is what happens then you know i wonder i think there'll always be an audience for uh art made by people but like how big will that audience be and and i was even thinking the other day about how like for every person that could tell you like oh i really value non ai art it's like the reality is that we all inhabit a pretty similar world around us and you could believe that you value human made art but then the 80% of what you consume could inadvertently be ai art and so i just wonder like what is that what does that mean not just for the business but just for people and and culture and how we relate with each other and and all this kind of stuff you know it's it's a it's crazy mm. it's a crazy time yeah kind of like for the soul of everybody what yeah kind of and like you know i think yeah i mean i just i i often think about how you know we had humans had music kind of probably before we could talk i mean this is one of the primary building blocks of of our survival it's like it's part of how we integrate with our consciousness which then integrates with the material world and 
it's already in a state or we already relate to music kind of through the marketplace. And so it's like when that becomes even more commodified and removed from kind of these more ancient ways that we employ music, it's like, what does that mean for the human experience? You know, and uh, that's what I think about with AI a lot, to be honest. Um, but it'll be interesting to see what happens. It will. Uh, I was thinking about how we can survive like without being like hugged <laughs> you know for yeah, instance yeah. you can survive like you yeah i've i've gone a long time <laughs> <laughs> no hugs <laughs> but it's so much more of like a richer experience with like that stuff in it the stuff like maybe it's not gonna be life and death um and kind of with art and music um it's really important but yeah you could survive without it but sure. what does it do and how does that then change um our abilities to like empathize with each other and relate to each other and connect and then even see things from different perspectives oh totally you know it's uh you know, i think you know modern popular culture has had so many moments where a song you know punctuated a big event or a big turning point in how the collective culture, you know, integrates with something. Mm. And, uh, you know, just to think about like that power being given to, you know, AI models and whoever owns them, um, and diminishing the power of, you know, some random kid somewhere to have the chance to maybe speak their mind and have that uh be able to to make a change in the world is is uh you know is frightening to me i'm i'm you know my hope is that you know we could somehow live in a world where more people have the opportunity to to do something that's impactful to others not less you know mm -hmm. right yeah i wonder if we're having fewer of those common reference points too now that we're yeah. all we get our curated vision of the world through our social media algorithms and the stuff that they know we're going to click on and, and pay more attention to. And totally. I, I do find it with, um, it used to be a lot easier. Did you see that thing that was on TV last night? Or mm -hmm. did you see the songs that were on MTV? Um, and sometimes I think we, <laughs> we kind of uh, resented that a little bit. But there was something nice about this is like something we all know that's going on and there seems to be like fewer and fewer of those things and if they happen they happen fast and they're gone yeah yeah i mean i i definitely agree i mean i think there's plenty of things to critique about how the music industry kind of used to function um but you know i think the one thing that can be positive is or more positive is that like when there's less like kind of less music being pushed it gives people more opportunity to you know to have more of a collective experience with it because you're more focused because you know like i was saying it's like if you go back you know in time to you know humans being hunter and gatherers it's like you know there there was effectively maybe one song and this then the song was constantly sort of changing and morphing within the cr communities but like you know i would imagine they didn't play a set you know you know forty five thousand years ago it's like they would just create music and that would kind of have its own life and then that would impact everyone that was there to view it um and then you know that collective experience is part of what gave groups of people their identity you know and i think that's part of how you know i think that's part of how humans are happy is to receive group identity you know because we're not just you know i always think about people are kind of like ants and it's like we need the the anthill of of all of us to get the full experience of kind of like how we work mm. you know oh yeah i mean that's why we're to this level of, uh, oh yeah why know, there's like 
eight billion of us. Yeah, it's not because we have claws or sharp teeth or anything. It's how we work together. That's our superpower. Totally, power. totally. Yeah. yeah, and I, I bet in those days too, more people were participating in the music making. Um, but everyone banged on the drum. Everyone danced yeah, yeah. and shouted and chanted along. Um, whereas today, I mean, I don't know, maybe this is a cool thing about some of the technology is that it might be, it definitely democratizes a lot of it. Um, oh, for sure. So I don't know. Maybe there's some hope there that maybe more people will <laughs> get involved. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, and I'm not like in a general sense, like I'm, I'm pretty positive about current music. Like there's a lot of current music I like. I think it's definitely uh, music at large is, I mean, it's always changing, but I'm not like negative about current music. I'm honestly someone that has a pretty insatiable appetite for new music. So I'm always hoovering up whatever I can. Hmm. Um, I just also think that, you know, like I had such a enriching experience in music community that like I, my, my dream is somehow to allow that positive element to be more available for more people for the context of their life and not to have music become more like just another thing you buy on Amazon, you know? Hmm. Right. Being around others and sharing it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, could, I agree. And I think maybe my probably low point in like current music was early 2000s maybe <laughs> yeah um just, i don't know if that was my age or just what was happening but there is if you look and you and you get lucky you can find a lot of there's just so much coming out these days that, yeah yeah um there's got to be something like you're going to enjoy and that serves you and hits you in that right way so totally the, the choice is really a nice thing that we get to have all that. And uh, I, I'm, I feel the same way. I'm optimistic. I'm, I, I feel like there's stuff that's I'm going to hear maybe this week or next week that really moves me and gets me excited. And um, totally. I don't know if I felt that in those early 2000 days, um, kind of, I guess that was a point where we didn't quite have the same internet access as we do now. And yeah, all the, uh, music just felt like it was getting overly commercial yeah. yeah and i mean i think too that like we're ripe for something like big to happen in music mm. um and i think that i always wonder what it's gonna be uh, but i think that you know the the time is now for someone to seize or a group of people to seize on to you know something that is new and fresh and really changes the course of things. And I'm pretty, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I mean, I think a lot about how, you know, as long as, as far as like modern music has gone, it's like, it's really been technology driven. It's like rock and roll was technology driven. And then all of the, you know, work on synthesizers, like turned into an explosion of totally unique sounds that had never been heard before in the late seventies and early eighties. And then it's like, even when you look at, you know, especially when you look at stuff like hip hop production, it's like, you can hear inside of like popular hip hop production, like when there was an inflection point with modern technology, which really was like somewhere around 2010 to 2012. It's mm. like the, the methods of making, uh, you know, music that was sort of stuck inside of the, you know, computer or in the hardware verse, like expanded greatly. And I think that there's, you know, been such a big growth in, you know, the uh, productions of music since around that time, that's been stuff I really, really enjoy. And so I just always kind of wonder like, what will be, you know, kind of the next thing that's just totally unique you know, like what will be like the next techno that has kind of very little uh, uh, seemingly connecting it to the music before on its face uh, that will just really push everything into a totally different direction. Mm. But who, know, who knows what it will be? 
Yeah. Well, it'll be a surprise, right? <laughs> it sort of <laughs> has to be. Yeah, exactly. Are there any things you're excited about these days in, in music, songwriting, or, or the technology, the production stuff you're doing? Um, any approaches you've been having fun with? Yeah. I mean, one thing I've been doing a lot lately, and I think it took me a long time to get to this point, is I've really been having a fascination in playing on the most cliche things that we have collectively. And it's like, I'll spend a lot of time just like really playing through some of the most cliche chord progressions. And instead of thinking about like when I was young and I'd write music, there's this part of me that's like really wanted to be, have such a unique voice that I would like avoid, you know, just the most typical, like, you know, two, five, one, or any of these really typical progressions. But now I spend a lot of time playing them, realizing that it's like, it's how you play these motifs and it's, mm. and it's how you play these things, which can allow them to become unique. And then when you also do that, you're, like playing inside of something that has a lot of historical uh, significance. And so when you make something that speaks on its own, but is like actively employing like compositional cliches, I realize like these are the songs that people like because it's like without them consciously knowing it, it's referential to hundreds of other songs. And then it's also in some way speaking uniquely. And so really for me lately, I've been spending time kind of playing the kinds of stuff I would have been, you know, embarrassed to play when I was 22, um, but kind of sitting with them and being like, you know, how can I make this my own? Like, how can it still have a unique voice while I might just be, you know, playing a couple major chords, you know? Mm. Um, so that's, you know. I feel that a lot. I, I want to be clever. That's like the thing. I want to try something different or break the rules of the scale or something like that, you know, where there's, I got to do something like kind of interesting and smart. And so many times, uh, I, as soon as I forget, I'm playing like really basic stuff, but oh, there's yeah. some kind of spin on it, I guess. There's something that I've found within that kind of framework that I'm enjoying. And then when I look at so much of the music I love, it's the same thing. It's relatively simple. Maybe there's like one or two little twists here and there, but it's certainly nothing like I'm trying to put together when I'm trying to be intelligent about totally. my music making. It, it's yeah, always the and, worst mistake I make. I'm be, trying to be smart here. <laughs> oh yeah, it's, it's the worst thing to do. And I think too, like, you know, I have so many friends through music and, uh, and you know, I know so many people who it's like they look maybe they love like you know power pop or whatever and it's like i know so many people that will be like so into these little niches but the reality is like the most popular examples of any given niche is also the most kind of pop music it's like the most popular things are always the most kind of familiar and accessible and i think that uh as I age, I sort of see that that's more tantalizing to me than it used to be. And it makes me kind of think about how, uh, you know, employing this stuff and using it. And also thinking too about like something being clever uh, sometimes can be more in the zoom out of the song. Like when you're making a song, you'd be like, well, you know, I'm in, you know, the third measure of the verse. And it's like being clever doesn't, doesn't happen right there. Like, it might happen in the album. It might mm. happen in the song within its context of any particular person's journey. It's like, and I think realizing that at least helps me stop to stress about any particular thing at any particular moment in a song because where, where the twist is or where the sort of hook is could be could could be anywhere you know like it doesn't have to be uh it doesn't have to be like the craziest chord voicing or some strange time signature or something which is ultimately off-putting to the casual listener you know 
Yeah, it's a good way to think about it, the zoom out, kind of the forest rather than the trees, the like do it there. And, and you're right, because that's, and that's also like the thing, it's a little easier for people to see as well. I, I mean, yeah. even as like a guitar player for whatever amount of years, I might not notice that weird inversion of like the minor chord you just did there. Uh, maybe if I'm learning it and I get down to the nitty gritty, but probably not when I'm listening. Oh yeah. And enjoying I mean, it. When I, I almost think one of my bad habits with music is like when I hear stuff I like, it's like my ability to be analytical with it just fades away immediately. And I'm just like, this rules. <laughs> yeah. um, and it's like, you know, the, I think a lot too about, uh, you know, I think a lot too about like who the listener of, of music is. And, you know, it's easy coming up in punk and hardcore where it's mm. like, you know, you can play in bands and the culture is so inviting for everyone to play in bands. And so you can be surrounded by so many people that really like aren't the listener, you know, it's like, they don't come at it like the listener it's like they come at it with their own baggage like i do as a musician or someone who wants to be a musician or however it plays out um and i kind of spend a lot of time thinking about how you know most of the people that will ever hear music anyone makes like won't be another musician and like what is it that they're you know like giving them something they like has a, I mean, I would rather give a non musician something that resonates with them than some, you know, guitar nerd guy, <laughs> some kind of, you know, esoteric pedal setup that really gets them going, you know? Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I just think, I think a lot about that kind of stuff about, you know, who's listening, what do they want, you know, and how can we experience it together in a way, you know? We get caught up in those little details and oh yeah, yeah. they're missed by almost everybody i mean even yeah. a lot of the producers and guitar players aren't even gonna pick up on it right away and yeah i i don't ever listen to songs for enjoyment um thinking like all right what is the cool th trick here what is the <laughs> clever you know plug in or it that might come after i've already i'm already bought in and i already yeah care. yeah I'm never gonna like get into a song because of some stupid technical thing they did or some oh. clever, not stupid, but yeah. like clever, you know, smart aleck thing. <laughs> totally. And I mean, I, th I think about that all the time with, I think especially with producers and a lot of people that end up making music too, is like, it's so easy to get lost and being like, oh, what snare are we gonna use? And it's like, you know, it's like the audience literally doesn't give a shit if it's a <laughs> pro light or a superphonic. Like no one cares about this. It's not, and it's not that it's not a consideration to make while you're creating, but it also isn't something that's ever worth more than, you know, a couple moments. And I at least have always felt like, uh, glad that I have a tendency to know like immediately what I, and gravitating towards so like if i'm working with someone and we're auditioning snares like it, t it takes me no time i mean it's almost immediately i'm like oh no that that one is vibing with me better um and so i've never really been someone to sweat that stuff too much uh because it just seems you know like i just trust my own instinct uh mm. to be like oh like this this guitar tone fits this song let's go you know mm. um where I really think the audience doesn't care about that stuff so much. And, uh, and that's cool. Like, it'd be cool to not think about these things, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's been so long since I listened to music and it was just purely fantastical. It's like, I'm jealous of the random person on Spotify, you know? Yeah. When you didn't know any of the secrets or how it was made and it was just, yeah, it's just something thing. you like, you know? Yeah. I guess uh, that's, and, and I've had that experience too, where I've listened to songs I like and been like, well, you know, that snare is kind of crappy sounding. <laughs> <You laughs> yeah, know? yeah, yeah. But it, it doesn't even occur to you if it's working, if the song is working. Um, I mean, maybe that's how you got came to that Tom Petty song <laughs> where you were like, hey, you know what? 
in spite of whatever it was that you thought was bad or didn't like it's I, still... I mean i liked i liked that it sounded bad i mean that's yeah the, that's the that's the part of it with this stuff where it's like if anything it reaffirms how important the music is yeah you know like it's something that reaffirms that uh you know, a song, a, a, a great song is timeless. Like it can be trapped in any production tropes of the time or limitations of technology, but a great song is, is a great song. And, mm. you know, when I was listening to Tom Petty and was like, this sounds like shit, like that's encouraging to me because I'm like, Hey, I can sound like shit too. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> and maybe it will still have what it needs to give uh, people something that can bring them something good in their life you know mm -hmm. um and so yeah it's important though what you said about picking the snare um because we get caught caught up in that so much and nowadays when you have nine thousand of them on your hard drive and, oh yeah and especially with the gear stuff we're talking about you can do the same thing with eqs and compressors yeah. and all this stuff um it's it's starting to feel like the most important thing is that you just pick one that you just oh, decide sure, sure. make that decision yeah. and then move forward and work with it let it be what it is when i yeah. for, when i have my four track and even still to this day with like a live drum kit there's one snare yeah just is what it is it, is it ringing out too long put a wallet on it you know <laughs> put a put a washcloth or something to deaden it, but that's about all you got. And then you just go forward and you're, you're focusing on the actual s song, the big picture. Totally, totally. And I think too, that like, I, you know, not to be too conspiratorial in a way, but it's like, I definitely think there's like an intersection of like kind of the gear industry and this kind of like, you know, because it's like that world wants you to be indecisive because mm -hmm. then you'll inevitably have to consume more instead of having a thought of just like, well, you know, like this is the mic I happen to have. This is the acoustic guitar I happen to have. And I also happen to have these songs and we'll move forward from there. And it's like you see all over a uh, discourse on the Internet of people that end up you know, they're writing their album for three years while they've conveniently also purchased $80,000 of equipment. And it's like, you know, it's like, what's really, what's really going on, you know, like, what's the, what's the point of that in a way. Um, and so I think now more than ever too, it's like getting things, finding a workflow for yourself that will lead you to finishing songs and and being done with them is the most important part of the process by a landslide. It's also one of the hardest things to, to do, to do as we all yeah. know. Um, but I'm convinced that this, you know, I think at earlier points in music, it was like, you know, there was a quality over quantity, but I mm -hmm. think for someone starting today, I'd be like literally release just about anything and, you know, and it will reveal to you, what you know angles you should go towards because you'll find that it's what people are enjoying more um and i think a lot of times the gear gets in the way of, of finishing anything um which is which is the opposite of what i think music is really about you know mm -hmm. or any art you know it's like you're not a you're not a are you really a woodworker if you have been making the dining room table for the last five years. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, I've read it somewhere. It was like a tweet maybe, but it was like a music producer produces music. So produce music. You know, stop yeah. questioning, stop buying gear, stop doing all these other things. If you're considering yourself a music producer, a songwriter, or whatever it is, a painter, paint make paintings, oh, you know, write absolutely. songs. Yeah, I mean, I've got... Don't buy paintbrushes all day long and, yeah, just you know... Finger paint, it's all, it's all you gotta <laughs> yeah, do. Yeah, if you're a but real yeah. painter, you'll do it with your fingers. Like, yeah. you'll, you'll, need... you'll snip the hair off your head and weave <laughs> them into brushes. You, you'll get it done. Uh, but, yeah, I mean, 
it's uh it's interesting you know music music's a funny thing hmm. so. well finishing is the thing we get the least amount of practice in by yeah. default because it comes last so you have to do everything else first so it's the yeah last road you get to walk on do you have any um anything you think that's helped you to get to those points more often to not get stuck in these things as far as like workflow goes you know for especially throughout the first half of my musical journey what i would do a lot which i should do more is i would just create situations that were out of my control hmm. that demanded that i be done it's like you know I would, with bands, it's like I would get everyone to agree that we're trying to finish this by this date. And then I would like book studio time. And then it's like that will force the hand of the whole thing uh, to, to do it. Um, but in modern, you know, in my more current situation, I think the best thing really is you have to get that mindset maybe without someone or something being really firm about when things are done. And now I think, you know, I think about how every part of song creation, like is its own practice and you have to turn finishing a song into being as easy as doing some guitar riffs, you know, like for me, like I could, I could give you an endless stream of guitar riffs all day, every day. I could just play and play and play and it takes nothing out of me. And so for me, it's like when it comes to like writing lyrics and finishing songs, it's like, I'm always thinking about like the more that I can think about it, almost like my aimless noodlings on guitar and make the process as integrated with me as my aimless noodlings on the guitar, then I can generate things that are closer to being fully done as readily as I can just pick up a guitar and start playing it. And so a lot of it is I try to just keep this mind state of focusing on that as well as, you know, when I catch the groove, I just make as I, I finish it as much as I can in that one instance. Um, Cause at least for me, it's like, I'll have these, I think I spend a lot of my time writing like trying to cultivate my energy and my mind space for that, like 45 minutes to an hour and a half where it's just like, and so it's like, I spend a lot of time just trying to be prepared to, you know, once I, once I catch that, once I catch the groove, so to speak, to just give it as much and get it as close to as done as humanly possible. Cause then for me, it's like, once I'm kind of out of that state, then I'm back into the kind of like listening to it, pondering, thinking about it. And that stuff uh, is necessary, but doesn't necessarily get you to being like, here's a done song and then on to the next part of the process. Um, and so, yeah, I just, I'm in a constant training to try to make everything as easy as the most rudimentary parts of music that are easy to me. So I guess that means working as fast as you can. Yeah, once process. Yeah, once you once you got something, it's like for me it's like all I also look in songwriting and think about how like all the best, not all the best songs, but so many songs that are really meaningful for people, like whatever is like the core of the song musically, like whatever is the core musical motif can exist all on its own. And it, on its own it still has that forward momentum and that kind of like automatic pull and so when i'm writing like i could go all day and just i'm just fucking around and it's like as soon as i have something that has that quality that it wants it like it has that forward momentum and it's maybe just a bass line or it's you know just a couple chords it's like as soon as i have that i just start authoring the rest of it as fast as possible. Um, and especially when it comes to, you know, like a lot of the fluff in a song, it's like, I, I will try to think about it as little as possible and I'll just like build out an arrangement. And, you know, typically when I write something and it has that propulsion to it, it's like singing is easier, 
and you know finding its lyrical home base, kind of like what are you talking about and why, becomes a lot easier. And so I spend a lot of time trying to cultivate myself for that moment, and I spend time not caring at all about anything that I have made that isn't in that moment. And it's like I I delete stuff all the time. I'll I'll open old projects and I'll just delete half of it and be like, oh, I only want. Like the uh, it's like the baseline's got the juice. The rest of this doesn't. I'm just going to approach it again. And so I'm pretty. Uh, I'm not too precious with with stuff. I'll I'll delete. I'll delete things. I'll especially when I'm singing. It's like if I have something I've been writing lyrics on and melodies on, and if I open the project up, some days I'll just delete everything because I'm like, if I had, if this song was done, this, it would be obvious to me, you know, like I would have had the piece that allowed the rest of it to take shape. And so I'll just delete stuff and, you know, don't care. And I think a big thing that everyone has struggled with that I think about a lot is like, you know, it's like the music. I think to make art that's good, you have to, like not care you know it's like you can't be like oh like this is my one good song you have to realize that it's like it's an endless stream um and so to not be too concerned with one particular little piece of it it's like any any three minute song can just go into the garbage it doesn't it doesn't matter in the zoom out it's about cultivating the force that makes that and so I really try to not hold on to things uh, and not get preoccupied. I'm looking for stuff that's happening immediately and revealing itself to me immediately. Um, Because I think, I mean, every song I've ever written, like the ones that, I mean, this is the most common thing. It's like the ones that people resonate with the most, like you write in 10 minutes, you know? And so I'm always looking for something like, towards cultivating what allows that to happen than hammering on things and which inevitably for me kind of ends up with me having a more negative outlook on myself because I'm trying to, you know, force something into being versus just, you know, doing it. Hmm. Yeah. You're, you're, uh, sounds more like you're fishing rather than, building or constructing <laughs> you're catching things and when you catch them you real you reel them in let's get it we got something so let's pull it in totally and it's like even what i was saying earlier about like playing you know just really common and cliche chord progressions is it's like you could i mean this is literally kind of what i do on the daily basis but like i can write little chunks of music i could make five six seven eight ten like all just using the same chord progression. And then it's like one of them somewhere along the line will have this, will have the energy in which it takes on its own life. I mean, I think about, to me, you know, whether performing or listening to amazing music, like it sounds, it sounds effortless. It sounds seamless. It sounds like Mm -hmm. automatic. Like it's just, like it's just generating itself without anyone doing anything and so i'm always looking for music that gives that kind of feedback to me that it seems like it just wants to take off on its own you know Mm. i was thinking about that with lyrics just today actually just listening to some music and like the best the songs i was enjoying the most all of the lyrics were and the melodies that went with them or just like things people say. Oh yeah. Just the natural flow of the language. It didn't sound like they were squeezing too many syllables in or it was just what came out. Uh, specifically, oh, yeah. I was listening to the Pixies on the way home from work today. And I was just like, they just say things, you know? And like, yeah. they, they're not like, none of the lines are incomplete really. There's not like these half lines that stop in a weird spot and then finish because that's where the melody would go. And it it has this like effortless thing. And I you know, I wonder if you know that's why you get some like interesting lyrics that they have because they're 
you know, like who says like this monkey's gone to heaven? <laughs> like, but yeah, the I, way it comes out in that, it just sounds like how you say it. Yeah, um, I mean, I, it's, it's that effortless thing you're talking about, though. It's kind of just arrived. It, totally. I mean, when I was, uh, you know, a lot of my early adventures in music with my friends growing up was very like making music kind of just for our own amusement that's like it'd be like joke songs and just like just playing as children really mm. and the reality is i think a lot about that kind of stuff because it's like it's so easy to make when you have no preconceptions you know like it's so it's so easy to it's so easy to fill in the words to a song when you don't care what you say you know, when you don't have any uh, any sort of hold up about who you're supposed to be or what a song's supposed to be or what you want to say or supposed to say. And I think that a lot of great music, you know, at least with songs I've written, it's like I'll kind of be hammering at something. And then at some point, it's like lyrics will just drop into it. And mm -hmm. I think that songs that are really catchy which, you know, I, I don't know if I've ever made a song I'd call really, really catchy, but like for songs that are really catchy, I feel like once there's like a melodic and vocal motif that has that energy, it's like, you can just drop, you can just drop words into it mm. end endlessly. It become, it becomes easy ish. Um, and so, yeah, I think a lot with lyrics about kind of trying to locate these little melodic chunks and little kind of motifs that feel like I can just continue to free associate words into them. And then within that, I'll start to understand more of what I'm trying to say. If there's anything coherent in that or, you know, any of the next steps, but I think, you know, and I think a lot of that is, like I have a really big love and, and fascination with like rap and hip hop. And I think that that is a great example of like the whole music culture is like about facilitating that action, which is just saying something with the music. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, uh, you know, I think a lot of the greats, there's, you know, I think rockers have a lot of hesitancy you know, they're hesitant to say something. And so they're like, well, is this really what I mean to say, yeah. you know, but in rap and hip hop, it it's liberated in the sense of like, you know, there's so many words in any given song and the word and the song really is the words that you can't, you, you're not afforded that kind of uh, over analyzation of everything or you can't do it, you know? And I think that's, that's cool. That's, that's like, you know, I, what I like about art is its ability to liberate. And it's like, in a way it's like, it's a liberated speech. You can, it, it demands you do that. And so I think any music that has that kind of element in it lyrically is interesting to me because, you know, my own ideal state is kind of one in which I'm just spilling words out without too much of a, care about like who I am and what I'm supposed to be and what people think and all that kind of stuff. That's my favorite way to do lyrics is to just kind of blabber, just oh yeah, let it out. You know, maybe if it's with the band, we're just jam on it for a while. Or if it's I'm by myself, it loops and just I'll record it and then listen back for, oh, that was cool. That was cool. That was a good melody. I like the way the vowels and consonants line up here and that's a good oh, phrasing totally. but totally. it's it's like stuff i would never be able to just write like to purposely do it has to sort of just oh, yeah. feel natural and i think like yeah you ever uh you know like certain songs you you might just like sing your own lyrics to like oh, like dude, a really good it, song I, yeah i do the obscene version of other people's music <laughs> all the time around the house but I think that's probably the reason you can do that is because they're kind of, they have that character to them, that, that, that uh, aspect where it's put together in that way. It's got that thing you were talking about. Yeah. That, yeah. You um, can just kind of drop stuff into it yeah. almost. Um, yeah. I mean, I think that that's, 
I think that's true. And I think a lot too with like writing vocals and writing melodies is it's like, I find that the best songs almost have like a core vocal motif that is really loot. It's like the vocal motif might not even be sung. It's just sort of like the arena it plays in. And I think that when you can find that, which happens a lot in like hip hop uh, to me when I listen to it, is it's like it will almost be like the the cadences and the melodies will be in reference to a simplistic motif that is constantly being woven in and out of the delivery. And so it's like I always think about wanting to create music that has that sort of simplistic nursery rhyme ism but then the vocals are playing inside of it uh and referencing it without ever being that hyper simplistic and so i think with really good songs that you can just start to sing whatever over it's because they've provided you that little box to basically solo inside of <laughs> and so it's like i'm always kind of looking at like i listening to other music and being like how are they building that motif? You know, is it even the vocal that's containing that motif that kind of is the playground for the solo of the vocal? Because um, I think when you look, especially into the charts of popular music, there's sort of like, you can almost graph it. It's like stuff that wants to be popular music will be really rigid inside of this sort of nursery rhyme, sort of Lego brick, version of vocal melody and then by the time you get to like i don't know someone like SZA, it's like she has these core motifs that are instantaneously recognizable but she's like she's like soloing like it's uninhibited it's cut loose but it's mm. inside of that simplistic framework which allows it to be pop music um and so i really spend a lot of time honestly like listening and thinking about those kinds of compositional ideas. Um, and, you, and you see the same thing, I think, in all the instrumentation. Um, I think that the more alive that music sounds, it tends to be more of creating a core simplistic musical motif and then, you know, just becoming jazz inside of it, basically, you know. Hmm. Yeah, you've got the kind of blueprint. These are like, this is the format, and now you've got play around within this. Yeah, yeah, hmm. definitely. So before, I, I meant to ask you this before we kind of kept going, which is cool, but uh, you were talking about, you know, finding that moment where you get, maybe it's the bass line, maybe it's the, the groove or whatever that has that thing, and then you want to attack it. But you talked about setting up, preparing yourself for that. What does that look like? The preparing for those moments. I mean, are you sitting there with candles, and or uh, is it what goes into kind of setting the stage to allow for that stuff to happen? Um, you know, for me, it's uh, I've been trying to be more routine focused um, and uh, sort of managing myself and my time, and so there's definitely like a routine element, which I kind of find in, in its own way is like ritualistic. Um, typically, my most creative time tends to be in the evening. So I feel like I spend, you know, like if I'm, you know, doing work that day, you know, I'm, I'm doing my work, which I think has uh, honestly like a good, especially like mixing and stuff is for me a really great way to like engage some of my creativity without engaging like my creativity. Um, and so for me, a lot of it is just managing my time. I listen to music a lot. Um, I'll, I'll take time uh, and I'll just flick through and try to find new music, try to find things that kind of catch my ear that's inspiring um, and really trying to just stay consistent with my time use and as well as stay consistent in terms of uh, uh, doing the other parts of life that isn't making music, you know, making sure I'm uh, eating healthy and, and being physically active enough and 
uh, for me, there's kind of a delicate dance of uh, being too busy and having a negative effect on my writing and being not busy enough having a negative impact on it. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of it's just kind of, you know, giving my time to the eventual moment in which I'll be more creative, <laughs> if that makes any sense. It's kind of like, a you know, in my mind more than anything else. But um, I just, I also really try, I used to be really bad at this. I used to really have a lot of, uh, um, like I would, I used to maybe like get upset with myself when I wasn't productive enough. I'd, I'd put a lot on myself. And now I think I've really done a good job of like, uh, you know, if there's nothing today, who who gives a shit you know like i really kind of ha i kind of have like i might sit down and start playing the keys and i'm just like i can't even do this and then i'll just go do something else and so i think a lot of it is like kind of keeping uh you know holding that space so to speak for like not every day is going to be a productive day and not every productive day is going to be one that leads you ultimately to where you want to go um and I think it's a lot of like a mental state for me of just, you know, staying ready and willing to, to create and be in the right headspace. Mm. Yeah. You, so you're showing up and seeing what's there and, but also, I, I mean, I know that feeling of that, like guilt of like, I should be doing this. It, oh and it, yeah. It's the worst when you are, you know, you might be taking some time to rest, which you definitely need. Everyone needs that, especially making music, mixing. You got to get out of the room every once in a while just to sort of refresh the ears. But when I'm in those moods and say I decide like, you know what, tonight I'm going to sit down, watch some TV and relax. And then I'm sitting there thinking I should be doing stuff. I should be working. I should be. And it's so bad because I'm not working. And I'm not relaxing either because I'm worrying about the fact that I'm not doing anything. It's the least productive state to be and it's not restful. So like giving yourself that permission, it's it's a hard thing to learn, but it it makes it so much better when you finally come back to it. Because if you, cause if you don't get that, then you come back to it, you haven't left. You're still in this thing and you're putting so much pressure on it and you're trying, now you're, forcing things to happen instead of letting them happen a little more where like to get those magic moments when something's clicking you, you can't be in that tense oh, no. state you, you got to be you open can't be. Yeah, yeah definitely and that's something i really struggled with when i was young a lot is like i would be very almost you know the whole the whole process would stricken me with anxiety in a way that I would become like avoidant to it. And then I would like create music and almost like these, you know, almost like I'd have so much pent up energy, it would kind of explode into like, all of a sudden I'd write like a couple songs at once or something. And, you know, and that's not good. I was my, ultimately I don't, I wasn't working in a way that I think was uh, beneficial for me. Um, and now I think once I've been able to kind of see that it's like realizing that, you know, all different, it's like what I was talking about playing guitar riffs. It's like all different parts of the process are just skills. And even though something like singing and lyric writing feels really personal, it's also like, it's not any different. And so now I much more, you know, take time to just aimlessly play or aimlessly sing and not be like, Oh, I've got to, you know, express my life's greatest pain right now in a song, you know, it's like, that's, it's ridiculous. And so for me, it's about trying to make all the different parts of the process, just what it is that I do with my time. And the more I do that, then the more that it will uh, theoretically be good. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, singing and lyrics are especially prone to that kind of feeling where it oh has, for sure you know like you can play your guitar and yeah you can put your soul into it but you can also just noodle 
you know, and yeah. it's it's both are totally acceptable, but there's something about singing and words that have an extra weight to them, and and they don't need to, like you said, yeah. they really don't. But um, I I get caught up in that all the time, and it's the part I avoid the most because it's the scariest, and it's the one that I feel the least capable in. Yeah. And, it's also generally the biggest focus of what I'm doing. At oh, the, for sure. At the end of the day, when the song is done, even though like I might, maybe it's drum programming that I think I'm great at, and that's people hear the lyrics first. People hear oh, the singing sure. first. Yeah, they hear the song. I mean, and that's kind of like, you know, I think that in its own way is kind of one of the big catch twenty twos of the whole the whole game of it. I mean, I think that people look, I think people ultimately look up to singers or other kinds of public performers. Almost. It's like, it's not the singing itself. It's like the willingness to do it. You know, like I, I've made a TikTok kind of about this where, you know, kind of like this idea that people are afraid of public speaking. And like, that's why the people that speak in public are like, CEOs. Yeah. You know, it's be, it's because they're harnessing something that like is frightening for other people and you know, I think that with music or any art, you know, in a way it's like I want my own art to in some way frighten me as well as in some way frighten everyone else. Um but it's like, you know, it's about it's about building, you know, a better relationship with the process of that and what that really means and what that means for you. And, you know, and the unfortunate reality too, is like we live in a world where, you know, if you start to do things in the public space, you know, you're going to have friends and, and family and other people, you know, that are going to be threatened just by the act of strength that it takes to do that and, and have negative uh, energy for you and, and that sucks and that's hard that's hard for anyone to manage and i think a lot of that is what keeps people from you know saying what they have to say so readily um because no one wants to be judged you know negatively for what they're doing um that's a big one and i think for a lot of people a lot of people i know have made great music but won't release it and, yeah very um, common yeah for those reasons um I've found something that's helped me with that is trying to take joy in other people's accomplishments like that. So like if you put out a song, there's sometimes, and this is still something I can feel too, I might feel jealous. I might be like, oh, there he goes. Oh, for sure. David's got another song. He's doing his thing with, you know, yeah, that, yeah. and I'll try to disparage it in my head in some way. And it's a defense mechanism ultimately, but yeah, when I've remember to switch it and try to really genuinely like feel happy for that person for doing it, it does like two things, I guess. Like for one, it's a much better feeling to have than this resentment, but it's empowering too. It's like, well, you did it. And like, that means it's not impossible. That means Def definitely I can do it too. I can put myself out there and it's okay. Like we're all doing this. So it's like a victory anytime somebody does something like that. Like we're, we all kind of win. We all get to be part of that if we remember to think of it that way though, because it's so easy to go down the, the negative road with it. Oh, totally. And I think that, you know, I think that's something that's kind of hard for everyone. I think everyone in music has been doing their thing and then they're just like, why, why'd they get on that show? Why, yeah. Why'd they get signed to that label? And uh, one thing I think a lot about in my own journey with that stuff, um, which has allowed me to be happier for other people, like genuinely is really trying to cultivate you know, like I kind of call it being the objective listener, but, you know, really cultivating the skill of really hearing what it is you're doing without your, you know, with, you know, without your self-loathing being involved in all reality, like taking hmm. time to, to listen to what you're doing 
and with that little bit of detachment um is is the difference to is you know i think some people are maybe less bogged down i mean i think some people are definitely less bo- bogged down with thoughts than others um but uh I think, you know, with bands I've and bands and artists I've worked with and with my own music, it's like it's really, you know, the defining difference between people that are going somewhere and people that aren't are, you know, like with I'll just take bands. It's like bands I've recorded that are not willing to self-critique end up with a with a worse pr- product. And I think most of the time that people aren't willing to to look down that uh, or look at themselves like that has a lot to do with like kind of what's going on with them emotionally. Um, and I even think about, I don't know, like drummers playing on time. It's like, you know, so many instances I've had, especially early in the career, it's like drummers that are really combative to play with a click or they're really, you know, they're just insist like, no, I'm good. It's fine. And it's like, that's the attitude that leads you to having a a worse product and so the more time that you can really look in the face of what you're doing and being like do i like this like would i put this on if i didn't know me and it's like that's such a hard headspace to get in and i think one of the easiest headspace that people get in is either thinking everything they make fucking sucks or they think everything they make is good and these are equally as dangerous you know when you think everything you make is good then you subject everyone else to it too and then if you think everything's bad then no one ever has any idea the either way and so you know that's the hardest thing about you know knowing whether or not you're on the right track is you can only know with a if you can approach yourself with a little bit of objectivity you know Hmm. it's hard sometimes to get there but i think you're right it's very rewarding it's yeah and and you gotta have like kind of the open mind as well that maybe they're not right too you you but take it in um and playing in a band has been helpful for me for that lately i've grew up playing in bands and then it was more like solo stuff Mm -hmm. but now it's kind of come back around to that and, and i get to do both now so that's important because i can really just let go into the collaboration of the band right like i don't need to control everything whereas when i was younger and it was all i had it was like no the drums have to do this part like it has to be you know but now it's the the point is collaborating that's why we're here and um sometimes and i I thinking back to like when we did our record like when they heard some of the vocals i did they had some comments on it uh especially in like the production of it like make it cleaner drier and i was like i spent all this time producing these things to sound like a way where i can deal with listening to myself (laughs) you know but listening to that helped a lot and it it ultimately made for a better product i'm going through that like currently um we're working on a track right now and um I'm doing the guitar parts and it didn't really work out how I expected it to. I thought I was just going to kind of play it the way I played it when we play live. Um, But when you start tracking things one at a time, drums and bass, then you're not playing it live anymore. So there's just a different vibe. So it kind of caused for me to approach it a little differently. And I like it, but I also feel it's not what everyone would be was expecting so i'm 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 imagine the next time we get together i'm going to hear about it a little bit you know and um there'll be some thoughts because it it wound up being like cleaner than i think we all thought it would be but it just wasn't working out but uh now i i have to sort of um see what's going to happen with that but i feel kind of excited for it whereas i I mean, there is a part of me that's kind of like, oh, I don't know. I, I mean, I did what I could, and that's it. But yeah, I'm afraid. I am afraid that I'm going to have to do it all over. <laughs> but yeah, I'm... it's an interesting place to be because I, I guess I know that um, it's going to get better, and I'm going to get better because of it. 
Yeah, definitely. I mean, and I think too that like something like your guitar part you're talking about is a good example of what I was saying of like, you know, in the zoom out of the song, maybe what you're doing is perfect. But like in the moment of what am I playing here? I think we always are too zoomed in kind of. Hmm. And uh, I definitely, I'm also someone that, uh, you know, suffered with uh, not being as collaborative with my bandmates as I should have been in the past. And, uh, and it's something that I try to be much more receptive to now when I'm working with other people. I mean, most of my writing is, is done solo, but now I've kind of even gotten to the point where, you know, I wish I had more people I was writing with to bring a different kind of different kind of energy into me doing my thing. And I think it's, uh, you know, I think it's super important to, let me think about how to phrase this. I think like if you're, if you're in a band or if you're an artist and it's like, you're the, vi you're the person with the vision, it's like, that is really a, a leadership role. And I think about how part of being a leader is like, uh, allowing the people you're leading to become maximized at their greatest state and i think a lot when i was younger i was more ego driven and was more worried about someone you know not seeing my vision or, or stepping on my toes instead of being like taking the leadership position and being like i might be writing the songs but like this other band member has a different skill that's really good. Why don't we put energy into making that as productive as possible um, instead of trying to be just sort of ego driven? And uh, that's stuff that I think is really easy to get kind of mixed up in when you're younger. And I think a lot now, a lot of that has to do with kind of my attempt at being an objective listener and kind of, you know, releasing uh, myself from my process of making art, you know, like it's not necessarily, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, even, even a good song you write, like, is it me, you know, and, and who am I, <laughs> you know, not to get just too lost in the weeds, but, uh, yeah, I think a lot about, uh, you know, dealing with other people in music and all that kind of stuff is, uh, you know, really one of the big challenges. And I think where, a lot of people, you know, kind of misstep in their journey and, and, uh, it's, uh, it's crazy, you know, being in a, being in bands with people, it's like you have four girlfriends at the same time or something. It's, yeah, it's relationships uh, you're trying to hold yeah. together and, and they're vulnerable, you know, it's, it's yeah. a very vulnerable state. Totally. I've really come to embrace this idea of like it's more it's more important to keep the relationship going than it is to have my part go in the song the way i want it or or have that drum fill or have that bass part or whatever it is it's more the the important thing is here is playing together with these people that's what counts here and if even if I feel deep down, which doesn't happen, but if I felt like this song is ruined because of whatever, who cares? Like, that's one of them. That's one. And like you said, yeah. like songs, they'll come they're, and go that they're not- They're just throw away. We're not gonna run out, <laughs> you know, yeah. like, off oh, we would have done that one, right? It's, <laughs> uh, and I guess that's true in a lot of relationships really, right? Like it's, if you win the argument and the relationship ends, then, did you win? <laughs> you know? Yeah. You know, what, what's, well, what's the, what's the point, you know? And yeah. like, yeah, I mean, for me and my journey playing with bands, it's like, you know, I've been fortunate enough to make a lot of music with people that were, you know, friends of mine from childhood, even once we were well into adulthood, you know, making, making music with people I, uh, you know, care about outside of being in the practice room with them. And, uh, you know, if there's one thing I, if there's one thing I would tell myself if I could find myself at 25 or even younger is just be like, you know, the, the relationship between all of the people like is 
where the energy of the music is Mm -hmm. and you have to you know tend to that uh in a mature and responsible way if you're the de facto leader of the band um and uh you know that's definitely something i was not (laughs) was not managing well at different points in my life but you know the energy you're getting that magic thing that happens when the group gets together and we play is is the important thing so it's that's the thing to safeguard and hold on to it's the chemistry we have that we all care about each other it's not whether or not this riff gets in the song (laughs) totally yeah and it's like and i think too it's like i think that like if you're riding with someone and there's like a lot of friction and assuming the friction is stemming from the actual music it's not like interpersonal friction Mm -hmm. transposed into the music right but it's like when there's friction it's like that i think is actually where the the secret is because it's like you you have two people that are problem solving and they're coming to different conclusions and it's like somewhere in the middle of that actually is probably your right answer versus like both people entrenched in their way of solving the musical problem and so like at this junction it's been admittedly it has been a while since i have made music with someone else uh like directly with me and it's like now it's like man i'd be stoked to just have someone be like no fuck that what about this you know but (laughs) you know when you're when you're just a when you're still maturing it's uh you know it's hard when you're young and doing a band and trying to make it work and you know, hoping that you can make it work real well. So now my ideas with that stuff was a lot different. It took me about 10 years of doing it all by myself to really come to appreciate that. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. So like for us, we kind of, it's not a rule, but it's sort of like a unspoken way of doing things. Like we don't, I don't bring songs to the band. Nobody brings a song. Mm -hmm. everything that happens happens when we're together and we work on that and that's it yeah and that's great yeah it's a lot of fun that way and it's it's always equal songwriting all that nonsense you know is just it will only happen if we're together (laughs) so why try to take away from that and you know fight things that are happening it it is totally totally. but that is a really hard thing to come to I guess maybe you're younger too and you don't have those experiences and these are your first songs and they do feel precious to you. Yeah. But and, you know, I think it's uh, uh <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think the thing with with music like any art is you know, even even at someone's most even keeled, it's like music sort of contains you know, people's hopes and their dreams and their in the ways that they imagine themselves and how they imagine they could be and so you know it becomes very uh and since for band related music and most music ultimately is relatively group activity it's like you know you have a group of people that all kind of interface with these different aspects a little bit differently and and uh you know it's a it's a lot to not manage but you know it takes for me it just took time growing up to have a realization that like you know, kind of everyone's feeling their own version of what I'm feeling when it comes, you know, time to to make these songs or play this tour or, or you know, go get some merch made, whatever part of being in a band. It's like everyone kind of brings their own little part of them that's like, oh, I, I hope it's going to be like this, you know. Mm. And so it's about making sure that everyone you know, gets to own a little piece of bit of that too, you know? Yeah. It's important to communicate those feelings as well. Totally. It's, it's very easy to have something that's going great. And then something changes where maybe you thought they would like that. Oh, now we can play <laughs> three times a week and oh, wait a minute. That was a little more than I wanted, or I don't want to go on tour. <laughs> you know, you, you, totally, have, totally. you have these realizations like once opportunities come up, so to have just an understanding does help a lot. But when I think back to like every band I've ever been in, my f- 
my general memories and feelings are of us being together playing oh, totally. it's not like he did the fill right that time or, oh yeah you know it's none of that no, I, mean, I don't always... remember those arguments anymore but those are the the important things it's just that relationship and that this is another way of enjoying your friends and, oh yeah i mean the great for me the you know the greatest part is just you know all the all the homies in the van you know <laughs> for just out for hours on end it's like in, in a way with tour it's like you could almost take the shows away. Like it's just, you know, it's just the, fr the friends in the van at, you know, four in the morning listening to God knows what talking about God knows what it's like, that's the, mm -hmm. that's the stuff that, you know, sticks with me more so in retrospect than playing any particular show, you know? Right. Yeah. That is the good stuff there. Uh, do you have a, uh, maybe a uh, technically I'll, I'll pick your brain a little bit. Um, how do you like to approach recording electric guitar, like kind of like your garage rock band, uh, quiet, loud, quiet, loud guitar stuff? Um, in general, like I'm pretty, pretty normal kind of straight ahead stuff with guitar. Uh, I, for the most part, will just go toward whatever mic I'm vibing with at the moment pretty center of the cone uh i oftentimes may or may not do two mics it kind of depends on my mood in a general sense with guitars for harder rock music is whatever genre the band is like if i'm doing like a more like a maybe a metal band it's like i will deliver less gain than you think um, mm -hmm. For guitar sounds, I have a generally big interest in kind of like note separation clarity. Um, and so even when, as you're moving through the scale of the amount of gain, I will always run lower gain than most guitar players from the bands will think that they actually want. And I think a lot of that for me is I'm looking to bring more of the chords and the voicings and kind of what's happening harmonically out um and two i feel like especially for harder music is like the more gain is really just more compression and for harder music that's more like groove based like you know hardcore into like metalcore stuff it's like i'm actually looking to maximize kind of more dynamics out of the guitar and so i'm looking at sort of less compression as distortion um, and then other than that, it's just really making sure the drums are tight, uh, whatever process is going to get you there. Um, if the drums are locked in already, then guitars for me, I am not super picky. Um, mm -hmm. like something I've done a lot with my own music is I'll be very much concerned with, you know, the drums and their tightness and how they are in the pocket. And then once that is situated, then guitars might be really not laboring over the takes. Like, obviously, the takes need to be played right. But, you know, especially in bands that I've done, lots of first take guitar stuff. Because um, I'm a big believer that, like, if the drums are dictating the timing framework in a pretty rigid and firm way, then the other instruments can have a little bit more flex um but if you have like a drummer that is not in the pocket not tight and is too loose you can't oh you can't uh can you see me still i just yep. got a low battery warning um if if the if the rhythm part of the song is not tight enough there's no there's nothing you can do right that's not gonna that's gonna let the guitars uh speak how they're supposed to um and so, yeah, my main thing for guitars is little less gain than you think you might want and just making sure like the rhythm is, is good to go. And then otherwise, like, you know, for mics and stuff, I'm a big fan of the M201 for guitars. So I might put that on there. Just good old SM57, <laughs> nothing too crazy. Maybe a ribbon, depending on what's around where I'm tracking at the moment. So, hmm. Yeah, nothing I'm, too out of the ordinary. I'm definitely afforded that luxury uh, as the guitar player. Like, 
I have the wiggle room, especially rhythmically. And um, as long as everything else is there, uh, it, it's nice, especially when you're trying to sing too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've, I had that kind of issue with this particular recording, like the gain, it was just, it took my guitar like out of the band, you know, and then I was listening to it, it was like, kind of like, there's just too much, you know, kind of going on, like all that like mm -hmm. high frequency harmonics. And um, it just didn't like sound like it was there with the band yeah, yeah, as yeah. much. And I tried doing like some room mics and it, it wasn't, it wasn't until I went much cleaner Mm -hmm. And then it had like a rounder sound. It's felt more like it was in the room. Kind of yeah, and I'm, layering in yeah, acoustics it, helped a lot actually too. Totally. Yeah. And like in general with guitars, I'm not I'm not super interested in a lot of like modern sounds, like even stuff like dual rex and a lot of the amps the metal guys like is not really my vibe, even if I'm playing metal, because they're like or even if I'm tracking something metallic, it's like, to me, they're like too compressed. And, mm. you know, some of those amps will have, uh, you know, some kind of clipping in the preamp, which is not from the tube. And I really enjoy amps that generally have a low amount of sag and a lot of headroom and then running them loud um, and, and getting that, uh, yeah, as I said, like kind of getting the dynamics out of it where it's like, to me, it's like something like a dual rec has a really different uh, sort of transient and attack profile, even if the gain setting is really similar to if you had like a JCM 800. And so in general, I'm much more interested in amps that have less of that compressed feel. Um, and, and obviously it's like genre dependent and different people have different kinds of feelings, but I'm like also a person that like, if I'm playing, or recording like more higher gain music, like I might even still play single coils. Um, I kind of am going for kind of more openness, more dynamics versus it just kind of really being smashed out. Mm -hmm. So, you know, but it's all contextual, you know, yeah. it's like different stuff demands different sounds, but um, yeah, you know, hmm. guitars yeah. are cool. <laughs> they're cool they're strange too sometimes like you said um the gain thing uh you, live you think it it has it works differently than it does when you record it um totally something weird happens it's weird when you click on like a distortion and it it drops from the clean because mm -hmm. you know that like frequency profile has changed that all that low end that you had with the clean sound has now been offset by that kind of high frequency stuff that's happening in the distortion and a lot of times it just gets wimpy like totally we, and that, this I mean, is and supposed that, to hit here and then it goes <laughs> yeah yeah i mean and that's really a function of like you know as distort as guitar distortion is just compression it's like if you're going from, you know, a clean sound that has a lot of headroom, which is like there's going to be a lot of transient information that is almost like beyond our ability to reasonably perceive it. And then you're going into a signal which is like hyper compressed. Uh, and I think a lot of times when people are just like using distortion pedals, it's like they just won't appropriately kind of gain stage thinking that they want to successively go from like, Clean is lowest volume, crunch is next volume, and then, you know, full gain is maximal volume. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in general, I tend towards amps and guitars that are kind of like working in this sort of progressively louder ism, like vintage Marshalls and stuff like that, um, versus, uh, you know, a lot of modern, a lot of modern stuff, like, you know, I mean, I even like, I like Saldano's, but even that's like the beginning of the modern sound where they don't have as much dynamics in the pick attack um, for, a, for, I think it, I'm not an expert on guitar amps and how they work, um, but it's like stuff that retains that pick attack and allows that pick attack to drive the distortion in the mm. preamp 
versus like just having the whole thing sausaged out. Um, and I think even for harder music, it's like I like to play into that dynamics versus like playing out of like, you know, just having it be squashed, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. I'm kind of with you too. I, a lot of what you said is what I'm doing. <laughs> so, and, and that's just, uh, but that's not, I'm not playing heavy music by any means. Mm -hmm. So it definitely works. Yeah. I'll have to let you know what uh, the verdict is on the, this last session I did with the guys. Yeah, yeah. Send me some stuff. I'd love to hear yeah. it. Cool, cool. Yeah, I will. Uh, listen, I've been keeping you a long time here, and um, it's been even longer than people will know because we ran into some issues on my end yeah, yeah. here. Yeah, um, my phone's getting near the end. So. Okay, so there we go. That's like one of those hard deadlines that you were talking about earlier. Yeah. <laughs> um, I never heard of a .lol website, but you have David Alexander .lol, yeah. which is I, great. I didn't know either till I was <laughs> shopping for a domain, and then I was like, "This one's not only cheap, but you know." lol i think it so. it kind of fits you in a way you know where your yeah i think so your personality too. I mean, comes through i'm a it. little i'm a little silly you know yeah but um any other place you want to send people to check out your um, stuff you know my my website uh as well as you know my tiktok which i believe is just david alexander 2k9 2k9 mm -hmm. means nothing but yeah. uh but that's probably the best place to kind of see what I'm saying and then get the links to like my work and contacting me and all that kind of stuff. Nice. And I'll put this all in the show notes so people can check it out. Yeah, that'd be amazing. And maybe a couple select uh, TikToks that you mentioned that I've seen. So uh, yeah, we'll put them in there too. Listen, man, it's been awesome talking to you. Um, thanks a lot for taking the time and uh, best of luck to you on everything. And uh, Of course, of course. You know, give Chris my regards. Will do, will do. Cool, man. And thank you for everyone listening. Bye. Peace. Thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. If you want to help support the show, the best thing you can do is tell a friend, someone you think that would enjoy the show. I'd also love it if you could leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. And if you want to support my work, you can go to brianfunk.com. I've got tons of Ableton Live packs, tutorials, samples. You can check out my book, The 5-Minute Music Producer, which gives you 365 short music-making activities to help you get started, stay inspired, and finish more music. And there's also The Music Production Club where you get my latest releases as soon as they're finished. It gives you access to a community of like-minded people who are making music and sharing ideas. You can share your music, find new collaborators, and participate in our live meetings where we set up some kind of musical challenge and then make music together and share our results at the end. That's the Music Production Club. It's a lot of fun, and you can find that and everything that I do at brianfunk.com. Thanks again for listening to the show, and have a great day.